All right, we're continuing our introduction to the topic of energy for our general chemistry course. Um, one thing that I want to look at to start here is units. Um, the units of energy, there are a variety of units that you'll see. Probably the most common one is the joule. The abbreviation for a joule is a capital J. It uses all of the metric prefixes, uh, just like other units, kilojoule, millijoule, megajoule, those sorts of things. And a joule is a unit of energy that, again, we'll see most often. Another unit that you will often see is the calorie, which is abbreviated CAL, and is a lowercase CAL. The food industry does use calories. You may be familiar with that from looking at the um, ingredients list and the nutritional information for food. There are calories listed, and that is the, that is the, the food calorie unit is the amount of energy that that food item provides to your body as it is metabolized or, you know, that's biology. But anyway, the food industry will always list the calorie with a capital C-A-L. And a food calorie is actually a thousand of the calorie units that we call calories with a lowercase C-A-L, which is the same thing as a kilocalorie. Again, all of our metric prefixes work with these guys. Um, the food industry does not want to put thousands and thousands and thousands of calories per item, so they have gone to the kilocalorie system, and they're simply calling it a calorie, but again, it's a capital C. We're going to use a lowercase c calorie almost every single time we need it, unless we're talking about fo food. To convert between joules and calories, you will note that one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. Now I've tacked on some zeros here. This is actually defined. This is exact. This is by definition. So when using this unit conversion between calories and joules, it does not limit your significant figures. So this is how you would get between calories and joules in a unit, an energy unit conversion problem. Um, as we look at our system and we talk about the energy in our system, the system is whatever we are studying. That could be a beaker with its contents. It might be a room if we were studying a big project. It might be um, an area of the lab. Most commonly, it is a container of some sort, like a beaker or a cup of some sort that we're, we're, where we are studying our reaction or our chemical or physical process. Everything else besides our system is called the surroundings. And together, our system and surroundings makes up the universe. Now, why on Earth would we need to worry about the universe? Well, recall the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says that the energy of the universe is constant. And so, therefore, we know that for our system to change energy, for the energy of our system to change, somehow energy either needs to go into our system or out of our system, and the two ways that energy is changed is either through work or heat. Either heat can flow into our system from the surroundings or out of the system to the surroundings. Work can flow into our system, work can be done on our system, or our system can do work on the surroundings. And so those are the ways that the energy of our system are changed. We have a sign convention for the amount of heat or work, both types of energy, are um, uh, either done to our system or from our system or by our system. And the sign convention is that any amount of heat that flows into the system is given a positive sign. Any amount of heat that flows out of our system is given a negative sign. Same thing for work. Work that is done to our system is given a positive sign. Uh, work that the system does to the surroundings is given the negative sign. This is a completely arbitrary sign convention, and so you do want to be a little careful if you're working in other disciplines to make sure that their sign convention um, is the same as this, or if it's different than this, then take note of that. Now, there are ways of measuring, um, again, the change in the energy is equal to the amount of heat and the amount of work that is either put in or done by the system or out of the system. And you can actually measure this in the laboratory. You can get 
um, data to calculate the change in energy for a chemical process or a chemical reaction, but it's a little tricky measuring both heat and work. And for chemists, what we like to do is we like to boil it down to simply measuring the heat. We like to make it so that our work term is zero. And if you go on in chemistry, you'll look at plenty of systems where it's not necessarily zero for your work term. But here in the general chemistry uh, arena of life, we do like to try to boil it down to simply looking at the heat that is either transferred into our system or out of our system. In order to measure a change in energy where it's only our heat so that the, the work term goes to zero, it will go to zero at constant volume. If we make the volume of our um, system, our container that holds our system, constant, uh, regardless of what else goes inside of there, and usually there are gases involved in chemical reactions, and so we hold their volumes constant, then we can boil it down to that the energy change is simply the amount that the heat has changed as long as you're at constant volume. So the delta E is equal to Q at constant volume. And as we're going to see in the next video, measuring the Q um, is something that we have a very good handle on. So we'll be able to actually come up with numbers for that. Um, the equipment needed to keep a constant volume uh, is called a bomb calorimeter. You do have a picture of this in your textbook. We won't actually do one of these experiments this semester. If you go on and take physical chemistry as a junior or a senior, you will more than likely do an experiment with a bomb calorimeter where you measure the heat, and that is the energy change for the reaction. What is more common, especially in the general chemistry uh, arena of things, is not to keep the volume constant, but to look for an easier way to measure the energy of the system. And in comes a new definition. A new definition for energy we'll call enthalpy. Enthalpy is a form of energy. It's a new definition in terms of the energy. The symbol for enthalpy is H, because E is already taken. Enthalpy is defined as the energy plus the pressure times the volume of the system. If we are at constant pressure, then our change in enthalpy is equal to our heat. Again, there is a reason why we're wanting this equation in terms of the heat, just like we saw up here for our delta E. Uh, and the reason is, is because we have a, a pretty good handle on measuring heat that either flows into or out of the system. And we'll see that in the next video. So an enthalpy change is equal to the heat measured at constant pressure the heat that either flows in or out. And again, here we can eliminate trying to keep track of the work by making the work equal zero and just monitoring the heat that either flows into or out of our system to get the energy change. In this case, the energy change is a delta H, an enthalpy change, uh, whereas over here it is the energy change. So let's look at, let's look at this idea of enthalpy in a little more detail as far as the energy change for our system. All right, enthalpy, along with energy that we were seeing um, before, uh, H, the symbol H for enthalpy, is what we call a state function. A state function is a function in which the, um, the difference or the change in a state function does not depend on the path. It's a path-independent function which means that we can calculate a change in that state function as simply some final value for enthalpy minus some initial value for enthalpy. It works this way for energy as well. Well, in a chemical reaction, the final state is the products, the initial state is the reactants, and so as long as we can get an enthalpy of the products and an enthalpy of the reactants, we have a clear-cut way of calculating the delta H, the change in enthalpy. Sometimes it's not that easy to get an enthalpy value for products and an enthalpy value for reactants for the initial state, but what we're going to see is we've got a lot of ways um, to get those values good enough to be able to subtract them and get a change. So this is what we mean by a state function. We mean that it is a function where you can calculate a change in the value by just taking some final minus some initial state. Um, some final minus initial value. 
Um, just for comparison purposes, um, volume is a state function. If you say, I've got a cup of water, and over three-day period, I want to calculate the change in volume of the water in my cup. I want some numerical value for how the volume has changed. Well, over the three-day period, it does not matter what happens to the water in the cup. It could stay absolutely the same for day one, day two, and day three, and the change in the volume would simply be the volume on day three minus the volume on day one, and that would be the change in volume. That might be zero if absolutely nothing happened to the volume of the water in my cup. Well, it wouldn't matter if on day one I drank it all, so it's gone, and then on day two I came back and I filled it up again, and so on day three I see exactly the same volume. The change in volume between day one and day three is still exactly the same regardless of the fact that I took a different path. Um, so volume is also a state function in the, with respect to the fact that a change in volume is simply some final state minus some initial state. The heat is not a state function. The heat, which is symbolized with a Q, is what we call a path function. In other words, in order to, in order to calculate the change in heat, the change in the amount of heat, you have to know what path the heat is taking. And that's why we define our enthalpy change is Q, which is this path function, at constant pressure. At constant pressure defines the path. So now we can do, we can measure how much heat, you know, has changed, how much the heat has changed, and relate that to our state function delta H. Our delta E, our change in energy, is also Q at constant volume. Again, we have defined the path. You can't just say that delta E is the change in Q. It doesn't work that way. You have to add to it. Are you talking about at constant pressure? Are you talking about at constant volume? Because those values will be different. And so this is the way that we can use path functions to, def to calculate state functions by defining what the path is.